All right, welcome into the Peaceful Leaders Club webinar recording. My name is Luke Wiesner, Director of Training and Coaching and a co-founder of Peaceful Leaders Club. And joining me today is pa uh, Paul Falcone, who is a best-selling author for HarperCollins Leadership, writing on a variety of human resource leadership topics, which I'm sure we'll get into. And by trade, he is a, a human resource executive working for what I would say, Paul, some pretty well-known companies, including Nickelodeon, Paramount Pictures, and uh, I'm pretty sure some more, if I'm not mistaken, um, you can fill in the gaps for me if if uh, if there are some you want to plug. Um, yeah. Paul has worked for a variety of industries, including entertainment, medical biotech, and financial services. Paul, it is so nice to have you here with us. Yeah, thanks, Luke. It's very nice to be here. I'm happy to contribute in any way I can to the cause. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm sure maybe we could get started. I'm sure I left some really good stuff out of your background, your bio, that might be helpful for the people listening to, to this to understand more about you. Can you start by maybe filling in a little bit of what I missed, maybe a little bit about your journey and 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 kind of what, what you're up to now? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you ask. I'm about to launch my own consulting firm for the first time after three decades in the HR trenches. So this should be kind of fascinating. Uh, I tell people I'm going from being a, a bond to being a stock, right? I'm used to having every two weeks I get a payment and I've got great benefits to start the month with zero and kind of figure out where you're going to go. But boy, you can make a lot of money. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm looking forward to that. That'll start in July of 2022. Um, my situation was I began actually in sales as a headhunter. I did that for about six years. I ultimately became the training director, the sales director or sales trainer um, for a small to mid-sized executive search firm. Um, and then I got into human resources. Um, because we were selling to HR people. So I thought, I like what they do. And, and so I made the transition that way. Um, I've been fortunate. I started pretty much with City of Hope, which is a wonderful cancer research hospital. And I was the director of employee and labor relations. So I learned about unions there. And then I went to Paramount Pictures and I stayed with Paramount and its sister company, Nickelodeon, for about a decade. Um, Paramount gave me the opportunity to become the head of international HR, which I love because I have a master's degree in German but I'm Italian, it's a very long story. We'll, we'll cover it in another podcast, but I always wanted to do international. So I got my chance to do that. Beyond that though, I've worked in biotech. I've worked in financial services, for example, at a private equity uh, firm where I was responsible for hiring the new talent. So they would buy a company that they would wanna put in their own CEO, CFO, COO. So it was hiring that new talent for the newly acquired portfolio company. So that gave me some great experience too. Um, currently, I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for the Motion Picture and Television Fund, which is interesting. We're a healthcare nonprofit, and we take care of people in the entertainment industry. We're primarily known for having a residential care facility, which is you know, skilled nursing, long-term care, independent living. Um, but we also do a lot of stuff in the community. We have community social services, so we've got our social workers out there. We help people with palliative care. We help them when they need finance, uh, financial help, uh, when they need insurance, you know, we're there for the industry and that's what we, we do. I've been here for about five years. Wonderful organization, very fortunate to be here. So that's my background in a nutshell. I also, I teach for UCLA in the Extension School of Business and Management. Um, I'm a regular, you know, columnist for SHRM for uh, Society for Human Resources Management. So yeah, I've kept myself busy over the years, that's for sure, but that's my background. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, well, that's great because um, the folks that will be listening to this, uh, will have a, a variety of different places on their leadership journey. Some will be just getting started. Some will be uh, very seasoned in their careers as well. Um, but I, I love the variety um, and, and, and depth of background that you have. And I think you have a lot to offer um, our listeners today. Um, I did notice um, that you have a, a series of books coming out, um, uh, or, or I'm sorry, they've already come out. Um, uh, I think yeah, they came out last month. month. Uh -huh. They came out last month. Okay, tell tell me a little bit about uh, about that series, and um, so people can get a sense of what you write about. Um, and also, I'm just curious the underlying factor about the approach of writing kind of a a series, a collection of books, and kind of releasing them all at, at once. Tell tell me a little bit about that. It was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> It was kind of something that I did during COVID. And, you know, we're at healthcare and we're a healthcare nonprofit. And COVID has been very, very busy. And people said, how did you have time to write? And I guess the best way I could explain it is I, I couldn't not write. 
it's like it was a frustrating time. It was a difficult time for so many of us for so many ways, in so many ways. And I kind of needed to have that creative outlet. I just like writing it. And, you know, that's my thing. That's my creative uh, opportunity to get stuff out. So um, the book series, the HarperCollins Leadership is the imprint, it's the publisher. And it was combined with the American Management Association. And they said, we want to write something called the Paul Falcone Workplace Leadership Series. Do you have any ideas? And I said, my name is in the title. And they said, yes. I said, I will write you the phone book if that's what you want. Because <laughs> I said, I have my name in the title. So it was good. It's a five book series. The first book is on workplace ethics, because I think that, especially today, it, 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 it's weird. Luke. We're in a we're in a funny vacuum, and I think most of us know that there is a crisis in leadership. And I'm not just talking about in corporate America. I'm talking about in government. I'm talking globally. We're all feeling weird. I, I think the pandemic has really thrown us off. In the United States, I think there's a lot of visceral feelings about politics. Is it? But it does make its way into the workplace. And I've taught the class when, when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed in 2002, that law, if you remember, that came out about companies have to have published ethics statements, their accounting controls, because companies like WorldCom and Enron and Arthur Anderson all got in trouble. They all went bankrupt and they came out with this government law. I was at Paramount Pictures. I was in that head of international HR role. And the general counsel said to me, there's a new law our CEO, CEO could go to jail if, if we don't do this the right way. And would you be the trainer? We want you to train globally. I fell in love with ethics at the time. And I've taught that class a number of times at UCLA. But there's never really been a book on workplace ethics. There were books on ethics in general, and they talk about Aristotle. Oh, I, that wasn't it. And then there were books on business ethics, which talk about Enron and WorldCom and Arthur Anderson and Theranos. But that's not it either. I wanted a book on workplace ethics. Like if you're a frontline operational leader, what are the landmines out there? And I wanted to write that book. So now when I teach the class, I have something to give them. Um, but that was the first book in the series. The second book was on effective hiring. Which makes sense. Everything starts there. The third book on leadership offense is really about how to motivate, grow, develop your team, how to establish trust, how to become someone's favorite boss, how to become a, a mentor and a coach. The fourth book is on what I call leadership defense. It's having tough conversations. It's knowing how to document issues to protect your company from liability so that if you move to termination, you, know, you insulate your company from that liability to the, to the degree you can. And then the fifth book was on new managers. And it talked about, I think we called it new managers, the big three, leadership, communication, and team building. Because those are really those skills that they really need to transition from being an individual contributor to moving into the role of managing others and being evaluated based on your ability to make teams perform at a higher level. So it's a fun series. It really was kind of cool. It's kind of a combination of my prior 10 books, but with this new batch, I'm up to 15 books. So I'm getting there. I'm, I'm keeping the right and going. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So I'm, I'm curious about this, the, the offense defense um, interplay. Um, what have you seen, like, I, I think from some of your, you, you've, this isn't the, your, your first time talking about off, uh, leadership offense and leadership defense. Um, so tell me a little bit about like, what kind of reception do you get when you say leadership offense, leadership defense, where do people tend to gravitate? Where do people have questions? Um, you know, we, I, I always, I think it's interesting when you described it, I could imagine people maybe are more interested in one, but run to another. Um, but I'm just curious, I'm kind of like what your thoughts are, what kind of reception do you get from this? Your instincts are 100% nail on the head. Um, people love the idea of effective hiring. People love the idea of leadership offense. How do you grow, develop teams? How do I become the best boss they can be? You know, how do I coach and mentor as opposed to being a unilateral disciplinarian and decision maker? You know, that's really where they want to go, but that's not where they go. <laughs> they go straight, Luke, to leadership defense because that's the pain point. Um, that's where, Paul, I've got a problem with an employee. I don't know how to handle it. And so the immediacy is when you look at the books I've written, one was called 101 Tough Conversations to Have with Employees. Um, one was called 101 Sample Write-Ups for Documenting Employee Performance Problems. That's what I call the leadership defense side of the equation. But again, usually people will jump on those. When I write articles for HR Magazine, for Sherm.org, those are the ones that get the highest ratings. People go there because that's where their pain point is. The other ones, I, I don't want to say they're nice to have. I think people need, they know that they need that. But when you're drowning and you need oxygen, you're going straight for the ones that are going to get you immediate relief. 
And I think for that reason, the leadership defense tends to get more press, tends to get higher awareness, uh, more amplification out there. It's because it's just where the immediate need happens to be. Yeah. Well, and they say, you know, uh, 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 the best defense is a good offense um, uh, or maybe it's the other way around. But I, I'm wondering if the the off like having that off like good coaching, good leadership development, engagement. Do you see that like having really good refined leadership offense? Does that help mitigate or reduce the amount of attention you need to spend on leadership defense? Always, always. If you're doing the offense side the right way, and I'm just using a sports metaphor when I say offense and defense. If you're doing the offense the right way and people feel engaged, they feel like they can do their best work every day. They feel like their boss has their back. You don't have to worry about the defense because it doesn't really get to that stage. But again, all else being equal, when people are looking for articles or people are looking for books, they tend to go where the immediate need is. And the immediate need tends to be the pain point of I've got a problem who's been here for a year. An employee has been here for years. We've never been able to do anything. And I just inherited this person. Or, you know, the straw is broken on the camel's back and we need to terminate. What do I need to know? I mean, that's kind of where people gravitate. So to your point, it's very well taken. If you're hiring the right way and you're motivating, growing and developing them the right way, you don't have to worry about the defense piece, but we're all human beings. And a lot of times by the time we jump into the bookstore and we want to buy something, we're kind of looking for things to help us out of the pickle that we're in. So that's what happens. Yeah, it's, it's it, it tends to to live more like right in front of your your view when you're in those moments and, and it's kind yeah, of out of sight when you're sure. when you're not. Sure. So let's let's dive in a little bit to um, it, on employee review. So that's something that you've written a, a lot about. We have um, a section in in the course that folks who are watching this will uh, will be will be in on and on how to facilitate employee reviews. And, and I know you, you've written a little bit about this. So tell me just kind of like broadly, what are some general kind of best practices we should be thinking about uh, regarding employee reviews? Employee, it, it, it's interesting, Luke. We, five to 10 years ago, we kind of went through this zone where we said no more performance reviews. There was a book out there that was called Abolish Performance Reviews. It had the circle on the, with a big red mark through it. No, nope. I get it, right? Because performance reviews feel perfunctory. They feel like they're administrative exercises. You do it once to validate that you can give the person a performance for a merit increase. And then you put it in the drawer and you never look at it again. I get that. And so they said, get away from it, especially because we have a new app. And with this new app, you can give real-time feedback to your employees. And boy, they're going to be happy. And almost, we're trying. We're doing our best. The first thing I would say is you can never delegate to an app what needs to come from a human being. Apps will only go so far. The other problem is these apps are typically built around recognition and appreciation, and it's good, nothing wrong with it, you should use it. But they rarely give constructive feedback or they're not built for that, they're not designed for that. And even if they were, you don't want an app to do the work for you, you have to sit and talk with people. Where the game changer is happening is with COVID. And all of a sudden for the last couple of years, we're working from home, we're remote, and the isolation and the loneliness starts to kick in. And yeah, we've done all these studies to say people are just as productive. And I get that. But the reality becomes, are they as happy? And when you hire new people on and they're working in these hybrid relationships at best, um, usually 100% remote, not uncommon, how do you motivate them? And how do you grow them? And how do you develop them? And what role does performance management and performance appraisal specifically play in that process? The big picture is you have to be more deliberate. You have to be more purposeful in terms of how you're communicating with your employees, how you're assessing their performance. So it's time to reinvent everything as far as I'm concerned. The old rules of, yeah, performance reviews, just do it and put it away. Okay, and you're gonna probably tell them there are three out of five. They're gonna be a little bummed because you're giving them the equivalent of a C. And then they're gonna be down for a couple of weeks, but they'll forget about it. Then they get their 3% merit increase in their pool. And that literally was the narrative, I think, around what performance reviews had been in the past. And there's no judgment there. This is in many companies. What I'm saying is the smart companies are going to be the ones listening to what Gen Y and Gen Z is telling them. This is the 35 and under crowd, which almost makes up half the workforce now. And uh, baby boomers are retiring at the rate of 10,000 a day. Um, that, that generation is moving out. You need to be smart and listen to what the younger generations are telling you. What they're basically saying is, 
career and professional development are one of their big five. They want diversity, equity, and inclusion. They want corporate social responsibility. They want environmentalism. They want some form of work-life control. I don't really call it work-life balance anymore, but they want some element of being able to work remotely and whatnot. You can't turn a, a blind eye to that and say, I'm not listening. That's at your own detriment. But understand they want career and professional development, a one-time piece of paper annual performance review process, which then goes into a file cabinet, never see the light of day, is not gonna meet that standard and you're gonna end up losing these people. So to kind of keep that whole idea of institutional knowledge going and keeping people engaged, you need to be talking to them quarterly. And it's just like an annual report, you know, it was based on quarterly reports that precede it in the public sector for publicly traded companies. Once a year is not enough, but the key is how you do it. And I come from this school route that says all motivation is internal. You can't motivate people. You don't have to bring pom-poms to work. I can't motivate you any more than you can motivate me. But my job as a leader is to make sure I'm creating an environment where people can motivate themselves. And the way you do that is by shifting that responsibility back to them. Let them be the ones to set the meeting on your calendar. Let them be the ones to come in and talk about how are they progressing towards their goals? What are they finding as far as roadblocks? Where do they need to pivot? And where can you help them as their coach and their mentor in terms of their, their own career and professional development needs? Now, when I was younger, people would say, you'd never talk to your employees about their resumes and their LinkedIn profiles. Are you kidding? And I'm like, I've always talked to my people about their resumes and their LinkedIn profiles. I want them to establish what I call an achievement mindset. Bullets is where it's at. Let me help you. I'm your boss. I will help you quantify your achievements. We'll get those numbers from finance if we need them, or we'll get information from IT. Let me help you build that profile for yourself so that you can strengthen your resume. You can strengthen your LinkedIn profile. It's very simple. And people say, but you're going to lose all your people. And I say, I have lost very, very few people on my teams over the last three decades across all different industries that I've worked in. Because when people feel like they've got a boss who wants for them what they want for themselves, they've got a boss who's got their back, they've got a boss who's helping them learn and grow and develop, they're not going anywhere for 15 or 20% because they know they're not going to get that somewhere else. So they tend to stay. You know, they're happy there. They feel like they're making a difference and they've got someone who's got their back. It's a, it's a very simple change in thought, but it's a profound difference in, in, in your sponsoring thought about who you are as a leader and what your role is. So I'm answering a, it's a short question with a long answer. Don't mind that I ask, but we really have to have that change in mindset. Yeah. Well, it, you know, yeah it has to adapt to the new generations, the new realities. And I think COVID has put a whole new trajectory, a whole new spin on the direction this is going. So I, you, said a, you said a few things there that I want to kind of explore. One, um, you know, I, and I've always looked at this as, you know, employee reviews, performance improve, uh, uh, reviews or appraisals, whatever you want to call it, um, as, you know, if it is that one-off thing, then it's, you're, you're basically, you're checking a box, but, but how is it incorporated into a larger system of giving feedback and managing people or supervising people of, of, you know, I've, I've coached a lot of, uh, of supervisors who, they save all their feedback to give once a year, which, you know, then catches people off guard, motivates people and, and gets people, it, it, it stigmatizes the process of, of being a negative experience. Um, but I also wonder, and I'd be curious your thoughts on this as well, of, you know, I think we tend to maybe have this negative perception of employee appraisals, but I think as employees, I think there's secretly a little bit of us that we want to know where, where we stand. You know, there's a little bit of like wanting a little bit of that validation, but I'm curious if you could kind of expand on, so this new way of looking at uh, it, employee reviews, it, it, whether it's quarterly, but in this kind of like, I'm gonna be here to support my employee to grow professionally, to support them to move on if they want to, but knowing that because I'm supporting them to do that, they're likely to stay. How, how does employee appraisals or reviews fit into that new model? That's why I explained it is when, when we got away, when we had this movement a decade ago saying abolish performance appraisals, we've got apps now that can give you real-time feedback. It's not an either or, it's a both and. I'm fine to have apps that give real-time feedback. Forget the app, just give real-time feedback, good and, and, and bad. I mean, it, that's your job is to grow and develop talent. 
And it's not always beautiful. It's not always clean. It's sometimes fuzzy and whatnot, but your job is to sit and talk about differences in perception. Um, and everyone has to be held accountable for their own perception management, right? It's like, I understand this may not have been your intention, but if this is the way it came across, you need to raise your awareness. So, you know, we don't end up stepping on that landmine again. Every employee is just as responsible as I am for creating a friendly and inclusive work environment. So if you've got someone who's being, you know, accused of being a bully or someone who's condescending or someone who raises their voice or someone who drops the F-bomb too much, you got to have that conversation. That's not always, your app ain't going to do that for you. Don't look at an app to help with that. But when you sit with someone and say, Luke, honestly, from a career and a professional development standpoint, I want to walk you through this. I will make it safe for you to fix this here so that this doesn't hold you back later in your career. But if you're not aware of this and you're just kind of running through your career, doing this here and anywhere else, it could end up holding you back. The most important decisions that will ever be made about your career will be made when you're not in the room. And the question becomes is what are people saying? And if there's a big giant button there, you know, Paul's really good at blah, 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 but, and that but says, okay, then we can't hire him or promote him. I'm not doing you a favor. I'm not doing you a service as your, as your, as your supervisor. Right? As, as, I got to help you through this because you may not be aware of it, but I'm here to help. That lets the guard down. It really does. It makes them feel like they can trust you. And when people can make themselves vulnerable in a positive sense, right? This is, Paul, I normally wouldn't say this, but you know, then you get in the real person. And that's where the performance review needs to come in. It shouldn't surprise anybody. You shouldn't be holding like the, the squirrel holding the nuts. And all of a sudden, nine months later, you're going to hit Paul Falcone. And also, it's stale information. It, the value of the information is only when you're there in the moment. It's the problem that you see in employee relations situations where the manager comes in and pulls out a big hunk and file and says, these are all the problems I've had with this employee. And I'm like, okay, I'm glad you got a telephone book full of problems that you've documented. How much of it have you shared? Well, I haven't really shared it. We can throw it in the garbage. It has no value. The value only comes if you share it at the time and you raise awareness and you hold people to a new standard of accountability. So this isn't rocket science. But to answer your question again, publicly traded companies have 10Q reports and 10K reports. The 10Q is the quarterly update that feeds the 10K, the annual report. If there are any problems along the way, there's a, there's a filter. You're going to catch it at the Q level, at the quarter level. It's the same type of thing with human beings. Once a year feedback is just not enough. Now, some people want feedback every day. I, that's a different story. Okay, but most people are, are busy doing their jobs. Some of them just want to be left alone. So, yeah, I, I get it. There's different issues. And sometimes it, it almost feels confrontational to kind of force these meetings. But if you set the meeting up the right way and you're asking them the right kinds of questions, most people will learn a new rhythm. They'll learn a new normal. If I sit with you and I say, Luke, tell me about how you're progressing towards your goals for the year. And tell me what blocks, roadblocks you've had or anything, anywhere where you need to pivot. What can I help with? That's not going to offend anybody. And if you say to someone, tell me about what you're doing right now, or do your personal interests really align with the work you're doing here? If not, is there anything that we can tweak together? Is there any place in the organization you'd like broader exposure? Are there any technical skills, licenses, certifications you want to work on from a professional development standpoint? The biggest question I have for you then, Luke, is what you're doing here, how do you explain this to a prospective employer three to five years from now? Why does what you're doing here with us right now serve as a link in your career progression? How is this helping you move forward? These are good conversational questions. These are not, no one's going to look offended. But the question I always have for an audience is, how many times have people asked you these questions? And they laugh and they say, never. And I say, right, never. Because in the old days, which I mean in, prior to, to COVID, these were not conversations that people had. And we're also looking at a Gen Y and a Gen Z that's now at about 45%, I think, 48% of the economy. In the next 10 years, they're going to be 80% in the economy. We know this is important to them. These are the two most studied generational cohorts in the history of the world. We know everything about them. Now, I'm not saying you can meet their top five, but if you're blind to this, you don't want to hear about any of it. I'm not doing anything for this population. They're going to do it the way I do. They're going to figure it out on their own. No one helped me. Again, I'm not saying you can't be successful. You'll end up being successful despite people instead of through people. And I think that makes really what the big difference is. The wise employer 
will look at those trends and figure out how to adapt. What they're asking for is not unreasonable. It's actually very healthy. All we have to do is make sure that employers are getting in tune with that and finding the right kinds of questions to ask and making the space for it so the employees can find their own traction to motivate themselves. So that, that, that's my lecture. But that's yeah. really what really, those are the new rules for the new normal as, as I see them. There's a lot of different buzzwords that are standing out to me when I'm listening to you talk. One is just right in the, in the title, review. Employee review, not employee. Here's a bunch of new information, um, uh, and uh, like I, it, it feels like that's really important. Like it's just right in our face with it. Um, and and the other thing that's um, uh, really standing out to me is the partnership, um, and not kind of this whole like ivory tower top down, you know, way of kind of supervising folks isn't. Uh, isn't working for at least it sounds like at least from what you're understanding is kind of this new wave of 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 employee and, and people in the workforce, um, but also just in the in the times as well. It's I mean people are maybe coming out of the pandemic in terms of uh, with new ideas of what they want, new priorities, and in, in terms of, of what they want out of um, out of out of their work and their work life. Um, I forget what you call it, not balance, uh, but uh, what what did, what did you call that? Uh, uh, work life. Uh... Well, like work-life control, I guess. Work-life control. There, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And who who doesn't, who would say no to having some control over their life, right? Um, so tell me, because this is, again, we're going to run to the pain point. Um, uh, so tell me, you, you mentioned this a little bit, you kind of alluded to it, but I'm thinking about um, avoidance, uh, defensiveness, blame when we try to bring things up um, and maybe not in an employee review, but just in the terms of, 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 of real-time feedback that maybe then you're reinforcing or 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 re rediscussing in, a, in an employee review. I I view these things like blame avoidance and, and defensiveness as just like truly, truly like common, normal human ways of responding to, to things, especially when what you're being told is being quantified by a number or has some sort of promotional or financial impact uh, to to you personally. Um, so I'm I'm curious kind of what your thoughts are on how how leaders can kind of navigate that pushback um, or the defensiveness or, or blame or avoidance in a way that maybe minimizes that or even, even makes it not a very attractive option in the first place. I think you should ask, that is an excellent question. So, so here's a scoop. The path of least resistance is avoidance, right? We know that. People are gonna sleep in under the rug and hope it fixes itself. Sometimes it does. Majority of the times, truthfully, you're just pushing it down the road and then some proverbial straw breaks on the camel's back and blows up. Then they come into my office. Oh, I want this guy fired. It's like too much drama. I don't do drama. The scoop is this. I always take people back to the second grade, okay? Most of my ideas you should be able to do on the back of an envelope because then I think that makes sense. But go back to the simple rules. Not what you say, but how you say it. That's something that when people get nervous, the body language tightens up and it can become very aggressive. Uh, my, my story was earlier in my career, someone was superior to me teaching me about employee relations. And this person would have me sit in the meetings and watch how she dealt with employees, which was, it was very nice of her to try and teach me. But what I noticed was, you know, you learn when we were doing terminations and there were salespeople, so there were a lot of terminations. The last thing this person would say is, you know, by the way, if you're planning on, on, on suing us, good luck, because we've got the best outside counsel in Los Angeles. And after hearing that for about 15 times, I'd be like, okay, yeah, no, that's not who I choose to be. I would never say that to someone. When someone is being fired, they feel very vulnerable. I am not going to taunt them or poke them with this idea of if you try and sue us, we're going to we're going to sue you back, so to speak. It's silly. But I realized was the manager had gotten very, it was nervous. It's nervous to tell people. I get it. The reality becomes when I say it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. You can tell someone, you know, Paul, look, based on the, what we had outlined in that final written warning and based on what happened yesterday and now that I've heard your side of the story, I'm afraid we have to part ways. We have to move in a different direction and I hope you can appreciate that. It doesn't mean that we don't appreciate what you've done and how hard you've tried, but I hope can, you can respect the fact that you know, sometimes companies just we really have to say it's not a good fit. We need to end employment. That being the case, I'm here to help. I will help you with your resume. 
I will help you with your LinkedIn profile. I'll do whatever I can to help you have a smooth transition to focus on something else, but I'm afraid we have to make today your last day of employment with the company. They're still not happy hearing it, Luke. It's terrible news. But for lack of a better term, it's said with love. I mean, it's said with caring. I'm not just kicking you out to the street. I'm here to help. And when people feel like, okay, well, Paul, my first question is, will I be eligible for unemployment? It's like, yeah, you will, because the company's making the decision. So yeah, we're not going to contest your unemployment claim. You should be able to get the unemployment. I can help you with that. I can give you information on that. But tell me what other questions you have and how I can help. When people hear that when they're vulnerable, it's not so bad. To another point, because you bring up such really good points. It's, when I say it's not what you say, but how you say it, that's a really important factor that people need to focus in there because I realize they're nervous. But another thing is don't come from judgment. Come from observation. You know, it's okay to come from the what so. It's not okay to come from the so what. In other words, if people, why did you do that? What were you thinking? You put someone in that situation where they're vulnerable, they're, they're, and you put them in that, it's like kicking a dog when they're down. Um, lawsuits are a tool of workplace revenge. Okay, They feel like they were stripped of their dignity and humiliated when they were most vulnerable. They can't sleep. And those lawyer commercials come on at 3 a.m., Call me and we'll get you $2.1 million, right? It's, it's, it's revenge because they're angry. If they feel like they were, they're, they were treated respectfully, even at the finish line, that they weren't judged, that there were good intentions that were assumed, but objectively the company needs to move in a new direction. You know, again, they don't like the news, but they can heal from that. They can get on with their lives from that. They can, they can move forward in a healthy manner. The truth of the matter is most people are going to get fired at least once in their lives, usually more. That's okay. Um, you have to respect that sometimes it's either not a good fit or the timing isn't right. But as long as they feel like they're treated respectfully and with dignity, you can say anything you want. I've had managers who say, Paul, I hope I never get fired, but if I do, I hope it's from you. <laughs> and I, I guess, well, that's a nice compliment. Their point being that people watch, and I think when they observe, just like I watched when I was earlier in my career, what I learned from that manager three decades ago was who I am not. And that's important. It's important to have bad bosses to help you define who you're not. I'm not saying the person was a bad boss. I'm just saying in that particular instance, that was probably not the best strategy. Um, but what I'm also saying is people watch you do it a certain way and they realize, oh, this isn't really that bad. He actually made it palatable, whether it's disciplining someone, terminating someone, laying someone off. When you do it with respect, when you do it with care, when you can say, I, I'm I'm sorry this is happening um, because I know this is an inconvenience in your life and everything else, um, but we have to move forward and we have to move in a different direction. And today has to be your last day of employment with us. People can, they'll be okay with that, most, um, but no judgment and, and no, no defensiveness and, and, and no kicking the dog while the dog's dead. So well, that answers yeah. the question. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I'm, I'm getting this kind of like what's coming up to me is helping people save face a little bit too. And, and usually when we get, and I'm going to relate this back to, you know, maybe uh, whether it's firing or whether it's, um, uh, you know, trying to address live, you know, real time uh, behavioral uh, issues or behavior. I don't want to use behavioral issues as the, as the title necessarily, but behaviors that cause impacts on, on other people or on the work on, on other people in the workplace. Um, people will then associate, we have this feel, ability to associate our own identity with that behavior impact. So we get fired or we get a three out of five. Now we are a three out of five or we're not employable. Um, and so I think it's the more you can kind of help help them separate those things as, yeah, this is happening, but you're also, this you're still a person and you as a, as a leader can occupy the, like I'm responsible for the position hat and the company hat and I care about the individual hat. And I, I often find that sometimes it's hard for people to wear both at the same time. Um, it's like you can have the water cooler talks with, with employees not relating to work, but then when it comes to performance issues or behavioral issues, it's hard to keep that human hat on. Um, and sometimes we overcorrect or overgo to um, you know, maybe a, a place that can cause a reaction or, or people try to save face for themselves and they do that through avoidance or, or defensiveness or you know, blaming someone else or you or something like that. Um, I'm curious, um, we have this perception or I have this perception or I have this perception that other people have a perception, if that, if that makes sense. 
um, that employee reviews are 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 there's this negative cloud around it, and it's used for corrective actions, and it's used for uh, uh, things that tend to elicit maybe fear in, in people. Um, we have it in our in how we're approaching it. We're, we have it couched in our appreciation competency because we feel like there's a lot missing. Um, there's an aspect of how how to appreciate employees within employee reviews or feedback that's maybe missing in how we tend to view um, uh, these these conversations or the processes, whatever you have in your internal to your organization. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts of maybe where what are some of the positive like things that we don't often talk about with employee uh, reviews that we should be talking more about? Yeah, really good. I, I like the way you're thinking. One of the books I've written is called The Performance Appraisal Toolkit. And it was all about redesigning your company's performance appraisal uh, template to drive individual and organizational change. And it talks about, I think there's a half a dozen, a half a dozen downloadable you, you know, templates in there, whether you're a startup company, a growth company, a mature company, you know, that kind of thing. It's almost following the stage of the organization because there's different values. And my argument to your point had always been, Luke, that if you're not changing your performance review every couple of years to reflect the new realities, I mean, you shouldn't be using the same form you used in the 1970s. It's probably something wrong with that picture. But the appreciation element oftentimes is missing. And, and you can try and build that in, but you get some, some really, I don't want to say warped, but mixed messages out there. There are many people in management roles who say you can't recognize, you can't show appreciation that goes to their heads. If you tell employees that they're doing a good job, um, they're going to ask you for more money. You're going to open up a can of worms that you should have never. Just let them do their job. I will respectfully argue that in the 1970s, that may have worked. The problem that we have with the younger generation now is they are much more mobile and they are not afraid to change jobs. My dad worked for one company for 40 years. My brother worked for one company for 40 years. They looked at me like I had three eyeballs because they're like, you change jobs and you go to different industry. What are you doing? Like, they didn't understand me. And I couldn't understand them because I couldn't stay in one company for 40 years of my life. Depending. I just can't do it. Um, but it's different nowadays. It's much more mobile. I, I just give me 30 seconds to take you down a rabbit hole. I did a presentation in Vietnam via Zoom a couple of months ago. And it was Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh cities, which are both high tech uh, cities these days. And they were saying, we can't get, forget about getting new hires to the one year mark. We can barely get them to the nine month mark. By the time they hit six to eight months, they're leaving. So they did all these studies and they said, you know, what do they want? What does this workforce want? These, these, specifically Gen Z, the 25 and under crowd. And the number one thing they wanted was to be left alone by their boss, from their bosses. They did not want to have bosses there. That's one. But the other thing they wanted in their top five was they wanted more career and professional development. And I laughed. I said, you guys, you can't have it both ways. You can't say you want more career and professional development, but you don't want to hear from your boss. You really want to I am your boss. That doesn't make any sense because the boss is the one who gives the career and the professional development. I said, you, it's almost like asking a 13-year-old, do you need more parenting or less? At 13, they're going to tell you they need less. The truth of the matter is, if you're a parent, you know they need more than than at any other time in their lives. They don't necessarily know what they want. So I said, be careful with the survey. You're using the survey to try and give them less because they tell you they want less of this, but they want more of that. The contradictory terms. The same thing can go here. I think there's some safe assumptions we can make. If you look at it, Luke, like performance reviews are horrible. If they're paper chases, I get surprised, um, and I only get negative information, right? This is the employee experience in many cases. Let me tell you the flip side, being in human resources. Um, I have just the opposite problem. A termination occurs. I'm dealing with a, an employment uh, attorney who's representing the company from a wrongful discharge claim. And what the attorney is telling me is there's so much great inflation in these performance reviews. Everybody in this company is a five. So I'm looking at this guy who they fired He's got nothing, he's a long-term employee, he's got nothing but great performance reviews, there's no progressive discipline, and you guys fired him. What were you thinking? How do you want me to defend this? Now, I'm making this up. This would never happen in one of the shops where I work. But I'm just saying, a lot of companies end up in these situations because 
the managers give milk toast evaluation feedback. They don't want to give them a real score because it may demotivate them. And so they end up passing the problem on for years, right? And all of a sudden the person has been here for 20 years and now the company terminates and they have a paper trail that makes them have to settle out of court because they basically have no defense. And when you have to settle out of court, it's going to cost you a lot more money. Going back to keep it simple. What is the purpose of the performance review? The quarterly feedbacks, for example, feedback sessions that lead to a performance review is to help the person understand where they're doing well and where they need to grow and develop. That's it. In there, there should be a healthy dose of appreciation, thankfulness, and that, that recognition needs to be documented. I've always put sentences in at the very end and then I've said, thank you so much, Emmy, for everything you've done I know how much you, you've committed yourself over the past year. We're a better organization and a better department because of your contributions. It's an honor to work with you. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Put that in, so that when they show it to their family members at home, they can be proud of it. That needs to be part of it, but it's something that you have to train because believe it or not, there's gonna be a lot of resistance. People who say, I don't wanna tell my people they're doing a good job. I just want them to do their jobs. Again, you're five decades late. That doesn't work anymore. That's not really where the future is going. You got to be smart enough to figure out, not only do I have to adopt, but I have to adapt. I have to do both. And it's not a bad thing to tell people they're doing a great job when they're doing a great job. Don't give everyone C's. Remember the college professors? Everybody's a C, no matter who. That's not going to happen. But don't give everybody A's either. That's going to hurt you if you ever try and terminate someone. You've got to find this balance in there. The bottom line is there needs to be more training. There needs to be more discussion. We need to sit around the campfire more. We've lost that ability. The elders need to pass wisdom down to the younger generations. And that's only going to happen in an environment where we can sit and talk. Lunch and learns are really important for that. When I launch my consulting practice, that's what I'm hoping to do in a few months. I want to get to the point where I can help facilitate these lunch and learns so that companies can sit and do those things. This isn't training. Forgive me. You can't watch a video. Watching a video will teach you all the technical things that, that go into a performance review. There's no heart in it. And you have to teach them the heart and you have to teach them the importance of the recognition and the appreciation. It's exactly what you're doing in your organization. And we need more of that because once people realize that it's a balanced exercise, it's meant to say, you're doing great at this and thank you. And we love you. And in terms of professional development, it's not always negative, but sometimes you just need more experience, but that's okay. What can you do to help the person shorten the learning curve? Is it a course? Is it a certificate? Is it broader exposure to the organization? Is it a rotational assignment where they can work in a different unit for a half a day for three weeks? You know, just three half day assignments over the next three weeks. That can open up their eyes to so much. But it has to, like I said, it's be purposeful. It has to be, you really have to think about it. It's not easy. You don't just pass over this stuff anymore. That asset, that human capital asset, whatever you want to call it, your people are the profit level. That's it. That's your bottom line. This is the kind of economy. We are not a manufacturing economy anymore. We're a knowledge-based economy. The profit lever is how hard your people work, how smart they think, and can they create and innovate. That's a basically it. Well, we need to move from the Henry Ford Model T days of you know, do your job and don't ask any questions to really getting to that phase where you know, we think about this. And it's easy, and it's kind of fun, and it's kind of creative. What's better than someone coming to you you, you're too young. You haven't experienced this yet, but I have. Where they come to you and say, Luke, I worked for you 20 years ago. I still think WWLD, what would Luke do? You helped me so much get to where I am in my career. I can never, I would have never gotten to this level without you. That's why you work. That's why I would say leadership is the greatest gift the workplace offers. You touch so many lives. It's a beautiful thing, but that's really where, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road, or at least it should be. And that should be everybody's goal to get to that level. And I, I think you, I think maybe you uh, you've written a book on this too, uh, leadership wisdom. I think, and the idea of like what you're talking about of those lunch and learns of okay, how do we get you the information and the tools that you need to know, and then how do you and then how do we help you implement it and give you that long term support in being able to do it? Because learning the tools is important. Um, but also being able to to know how to do it is important, and then having support 
throughout years of practice so you can build new habits and build new ways of doing things is equally as important. Otherwise, you're just going to you're going to try it once and it's not going to work for you and you'll just go back to the old ways of doing it. Um, so which kind of leads me and I, I'm being mindful of time and I don't want to keep you too long, but there's one one or two more things I want to explore with you. Um, so all the things that we've talked about today, let's say somebody's watching this and they're like, oh, this is blowing my mind in terms of how I want to approach feedback, employee reviews, or, or any of the other things we've talked about. I want to look at this from two different lenses. One, the new manager, the, 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 new, sup the new supervisor, the new leader who maybe just got promoted in that position performance uh, or employee reviews are right on the horizon and they're now giving those reviews to their former coworkers or uh, maybe leaders who have been doing this for years or decades and are like, oh, I want to try something different. How do I start? Maybe I'm asking you kind of two different perspectives at the same time, but maybe you could kind of unpack like if for those two perspectives, how, how might they start approaching uh, what we're talking about today? Yep, good. I, both really good questions. So the first thing I would say is when you've got the new, newly minted manager, right, who used to work with their peers, and now they're anointed. They're the one in charge of their peers. Um, don't leave them to figure this out on their own. It's too hard. There's too many traps. People are resentful. They're happy that Paul got promoted. Oh, it's great that he's going to be our director of our department. By about two months, three months later, they're jabbing him, they're punching him. He doesn't know which way to go. For some people, he becomes a jellyfish. Oh, we're still friends, aren't we? Don't worry, nothing's really changed. For other people, he turns into General Patton. Well, I'm your boss now, I'm not your friend. So it's hard. The, the, the book by Marshall Goldsmith has the best title, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And I love the title. I, I read that book and I was like, this is, this is a, but the point is what makes you successful as an individual contributor is probably what gets you earmarked for management. It's good. But once you're in management, it's a whole different game because we're not interested. Well, you're still going to be an individual contributor. Everybody's a hands-on manager these days. But, but the reality is you're now measured by how successful your people are as opposed to how successful you are. And some people are never able to make that break. So you see managers who naturally go back to what they were comfortable with, which is doing all the work themselves. But then they're also responsible for doing all the admin stuff for the department. And then they burn themselves out because they were not able to break the, the, the chain there that says, okay, I'm no longer in box A, I'm now in box B. What does that need to look like? They need to literally go through a paper exercise. This is what I did before. This is what I think I'm gonna be doing going forward. Um, they need to talk about their values with their team. I hear you, handbooks, policy and procedure manuals, collective bargaining agreements, code of conduct, all of that stuff is great. You need to talk about what's important to you. What are your top five or your top 10? Get everyone to agree on that. Ask them for input, amend it, but come up with a department list of values. The values keep everything in context. It keeps everyone aligned. It's one thing for a person to say, I don't care if I violate that stupid policy. It's a stupid policy anyway, as opposed to, I really better not do this because I don't want to hurt Paul's feelings. See, that's where the humanity comes in. And that's why I'm saying leadership has to have that personal touch to it. So my bottom line on that one is with new supervisors, coach them. Meet with them once a week for the first 90 days. Make sure that they can come to you for questions. Make sure that they can share with you where they're having challenges and problems. Don't just throw them out there and help them figure it on their own. If they turn into General Patton, they'll turn everyone off. Oh, Paul used to be so cool until they made a manager. And now he acts you know, so remote. Or Paul isn't really respected because Paul is just a jellyfish. and He does whatever. And, and the reality is Paul does his old job as an individual contributor because it's his comfort zone. But now he's burning out because he's doing all this other stuff too. You've got to be there to give them the, the wisdom to see the difference. Knowledge is one thing. I, the, the way I've always said it is, you know, knowledge is fine, but wisdom is knowledge applied. Getting to the wisdom level is a lot different than just knowing the knowledge piece. Videos will give you knowledge. They won't give you, they won't give you wisdom. Okay, on the flip side, when you've got the long-term manager who's kind of all of a sudden saying, I really want to do this. I want to reinvent myself and I want to reinvent my team, but I've never done this before. Sit and talk about it. Talking over the campfire, having the wisdom pass along to the younger generations, you don't need to know all the answers. Management used to be about knowing all the answers back in the days of you know, the Ford conveyor belt line, right? Now, managers are good as coaches. They tease the information out of their own employees. 
They help the employees come to their own reality. And then we adapt as a group. <clears throat> I've never sat back and said, I've got all the answers. The best people who know the work are the ones in the trenches. So my job is to create an environment where it's safe for them to share their suggestions. And then we incorporate it as a team. It's that simple. This is not hard. Again, most of this stuff can be explained on the back of an envelope. But whether it's because of stubbornness or people who have, you know, they've kind of created the sense in their mind, well, once you're a manager, you know, you're supposed to know that. It's like, nah, not really. Once you're a manager, you're supposed to know how to get the most out of your people. And that means knowing them individually. And that means knowing them as a group. And that's going to come from weekly staff meetings. That's going to come from quarterly one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, that's where it comes from. That's where the trust builds over time. Um, again, I've not had much turnover on my teams. When we did have turnover, it was something we can celebrate. If there was a manager on my team who I couldn't promote, they got a job as a director somewhere else, bring in the bagels. Okay, let's all have fun. Because you know what? It was because of the experience here that so-and-so is, is able to promote into a new opportunity in another company. And we celebrate that. Can I, can I add something to that? Sure. I, because that's really important because I've, I've been a part of companies that have celebrated people leaving and kind of made people feel bad for leaving. And one thing that happened, well, the biggest difference is not for the person who's leaving, but the people who are staying and what that is communicating to the people who are staying, how they feel valued by, by their supervisor, their leader. Um, and it's just a good way to just kind of take morale to 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 not celebrate somebody who's who, who's leaving. So I, I just it's just it's just it's just like such an easy way to to help people feel valued. Yeah, I, I agree. It's almost like the parenting, right? What, what we would tell our kids, my wife and I, if you ever have a problem, tell us. No one's going to give you a better answer than us. Not your friends. Come to us. There's nothing you can tell us that's going to shock us. Nothing. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm here for you. So you come and tell, and that's kind of the relationship you want to develop with your kids. A lot of leadership I've learned from parenting in terms of how to deal with two-year-olds and everything else. But, but the point becomes, if they feel like, you, 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 the expression I would tell my kids is, I want for you what you want for you. Not, I want for you what I want for me through you. That's the difference. And they can understand that concept by the time they're in high school. I'm not doing this stuff because I want them to do what I want. I'm doing this because I want to help them get where they need to get. That same message is something you tell your employees. Your employees aren't going anywhere. They're not going to find that in someone else's shop. Yeah, it'd be nice to get 15 to 20% to leave. But really, there's a big risk because if I'm not working for someone who I like and I trust and I respect with a team that gets along with one another, what's the 20% going to do after taxes? I'm not even going to see a difference. I'm going to get 100 bucks in a paycheck. It doesn't matter. So I'm just saying, I think from a, from a common sense standpoint, you can reinvent yourself, Luke, as a new manager. You can reinvent yourself as someone who's been doing it like me for three decades, just by changing your sponsoring thought about who you are and who you choose to be. That's, what, that's new, that's creative, that's fun. I can't imagine doing the same thing over and over again. It's the manager who says, I've been a manager for 20 years. And I sit back and I'm like, I don't say this, but I'm thinking to myself, no, you've been a manager for one year. You just repeated it 20 times. Because what I'm hearing you say is not the most you know, advanced uh, leadership thinking I've ever heard. But there are troglodyte managers out there, right? Darth manager, this idea of how this person ever moved into the job, I don't know. But as an HR guy, I've got to help them through. Some people are better and more natural in leadership. Other people, not so much. But the good news is it is a teachable um, skill. It, 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 this isn't the end of the world. I can't teach people how to care. I can't teach people how to love. That much I can't do. But at the same time, if you can teach people how to set things up so that there's space for people to motivate themselves, for people to give you feedback about their own career and professional development and ask you to help them get where they need to get, for you to say, I'll help you with your resume, I'll help you with your LinkedIn profile, I'll help you with your um, self-review as you're preparing for your annual report. Um, that means a lot. I've always told people, look, if you're looking to change jobs, come and tell me, I'll help you. You don't have to say, I'm not expecting you to retire here when you're 65. Now, that's a little weird because a lot of people don't agree with that. Don't use it if you don't agree with it. But I never want to be the manager's whole thing. Paul Falcone finds out that I'm looking, he'll find a way to fire me. That exists out there. Lord knows it's not in any of my writing. That, that's not really where the future of leadership lies. And you're not going to get much out of that other than turnover 
and probably mediocre performance. You can try and control that, but you're never going to get their heart. You'll get their mind. They'll, they'll give you maybe 100%, but you're never going to get the discretionary effort that, yeah. because they don't want to do it. They'll hold back on that on purpose. Yeah, well, you're undermining you're undermining psychological safety. You're not going to trust, you know, that that you have their back. Um, and like you said, you're either, you know, it's either going to lead to turn to turnover or they'll stay. But uh, you know, do you, do you want a mediocre performance for 20 years, or do you want really high performing uh, people, maybe who who every once in a while find good opportunities for themselves? Um, yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that the way we've structured our program at, with the Peaceful Leaders certification is we try to give people the information and then we offer unlimited coaching on how to implement uh, implement those tools. And so for I'm just thinking about for the people who are interested in trying to take the stuff that you're talking about and, and who are in our program and implement things, come to the group coaching sessions, you can come to as many as you want, take advantage of the coaches and other uh, people who are on this journey too, uh, to be able to find new ways of, of, of practicing these things. Cause that's, I think a lot of people know this stuff, but it's either uncomfortable or they don't know how. And I appreciate I, my sense from your books and your literature is you focus on the how. Um, and, uh, so for, for an additional resources for people listening to this, check out Paul Falcone's books, um, kind of centered on the how of how to do some of these things. And before I let you go, cause I know we're just about at time. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you um, this question. I'll put you on the spot a little bit. You have a lot of books that are like 2,600 phrases or, or 101 uh, phrases or, or you know, th things like that. So give me, a, give me a couple of your favorite. Give me a couple of your, like one or two of your favorite phrases that you've come up with in, in your books for, for whatever topic. Just things that you- Phrases? Oh. Tried oh. and true phrases that you like. Tried and true phrases, okay. So one of the things I talk about is we talked a little bit about behavior problems, right? It's the ones who are just acting out. Hold people accountable for their own perception management. Perception is one of those words that are like, it's like feelings. Feelings aren't right or wrong. They just are. Perception isn't right or wrong. It just is. You have the right as a leader to talk about your perception of how someone's coming across. That makes it much easier. If you say to someone, boy, you've got a bad attitude. Attitude is a fighting word. You never want to use that word when you're having a conversation and never use it in your documentation. Courts have dismissed it and said basically differences in opinion and style, but they'll, they'll invalidate discipline that's based on a quote unquote bad attitude. But you have the right to talk about behaviors. You have a right to talk about conduct and you have a right to say from my vantage point, this is how it feels. This is how it strikes me. There's a humility in that. There's a humanity in that. People aren't going to fight you when you say that. And when you say, Paul, I have to hold you accountable for your own perception management, it's, like, it's not a matter of your intention. It's how it's coming across to others. And other people are now coming to me and saying they're uncomfortable. Therefore, we have to fix it as an organization. Perception is probably the most important phrase. It really is, because to me, it gives you the discretion to talk about anything in a very respectful way, including bad breath, bad attitudes, <laughs> Anything else, that's kind of where you go with it. Dude. So I think that if you can get people to that stage where they're holding themselves accountable for how they come across to others, they're naturally making a friendly and inclusive work environment. So that would be my number one phrase if I had to pick. Fantastic. It's like holding up the mirror for them to be able to see for themselves. And it's almost kind of like gently offering some feedback for them to be able to agree or disagree with um, and early start a conversation. Um, Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I, we hope to have you back uh, uh, later on. Um, and uh, thanks so much for, for all your time. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. And good luck with everything you're doing. I love the fact that you guys will do the, the implementation stage, that they can come to you to learn more about the how and have a safe place to talk about that. That is a beautiful business model. I think you'll be very successful with that. So continue you know, success in everything you're doing. Thanks, Paul. We'll, 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 we'll see you next time. Sounds good, Luke. Thanks.